so. Hello. Hey. Hi, Dr. Butler. How are you doing? Hey. Who's, who's that? <laughs> I didn't know you let people from Louisiana in on these things. Say bon comme ça va. I just started speaking English. Go Tigers. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Go Southern Mississippi. <laughs> Gary, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you doing, doctor? It's good to see you. Same uh, as always. Looks like we have a good group here, huh? We do. We do. And Jorge, we're up to 22 participants. So whenever you are ready to start. All right. Uh, welcome to session seven of the readiness training program for historically underutilized businesses or the RTP for hubs. My name is Jorge Anchondo. I am the session moderator. Emily uh, Spandico, our project manager, has shared the moderator duties with me. Thank you, Emily, for all your help. Uh, I also want to recognize our student interns, Katika Batlaha and Cecilia Guerra. Today's session is entitled Principles and Elements of a Successful Business, featuring Mr. Gary Hoover. As we have done throughout, uh, we want to acknowledge our sponsors, Travis County, the University of Texas, and the IC Squared Institute. Thank you to Ms. Karen Box and Ms. Ty Scroggins for their private sector presentations last week. Uh, thanks as well to Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Terry Chase, uh, Mrs. Ch Cheryl Brown, Dr. April Lovelady, and our own Dr. Uh, John Butler for their expert and passionate participation in workshop number two. Special thanks to Dr. Jim Jarrett, our co-principal investigator, for his superb workshop organizational efforts and leadership throughout Funnel 2. I want to recognize Dr. Uh, John C. Billy Butler, our principal investigator and esteemed uh, leader. Dr. Butler, you know Mr. Hoover, our featured speaker. Uh, yes, I do. Let me just say something before he is formally introduced. You know, Austin was built entrepreneurs. And when I say that Austin was built on entrepreneurs, I mean that Gary Hoover was one of the people who actually built Austin. Can everybody hear me still? Uh, yep. Faintly, faintly, but, but yeah. you may have to speak louder. What I'm saying is that Gary Hoover is one of the building blocks of Austin, Texas. We have known each other for years. He's certainly spoken to my class for years. But let me tell you about him before the former. He's an intellectual, University of Chicago, studied with the best economists in the world. Came to Austin, did the first big box store. And more importantly now, he is a teacher. He has the best, absolutely best business history organizations in America. Gary and I always said that business history should be taught in every program. So I'm delighted to have my good friend, Gary Hoover, to talk today. And I now I will let Dr. Jared introduce him formally. Oh, thank you, Dr. Butler. Before Dr. Jared introduces Mr. Hoover, I want to focus in on the last part of our RTP goal. And that's, quote, to bid competitively on both uh, public and private sector procurement opportunities, unquote. I stated in the first session that we should add and win after competitively. Of course, all of you have, and hopefully uh, we have shown you how to win. And as I say, more better. We wish you continued success. Dr. Jarrett. Okay. Gary Hoover is a serial entrepreneur business historian, author, and teacher. He's been studying business since he was 12 years old when he first subscribed to Fortune Magazine. By the age of 18, he had visited hundreds of corporate headquarters, trying to answer the fundamental question of what separates very successful companies from mediocre and failing companies. 
As John mentioned, Gary graduated from the University of Chicago, studying under Milton Friedman, the renowned economist. A couple of years later, at the age of 30, Gary co-founded book superstore chain Bookstop, and seven years later, sold it to Barnes & Noble for $41.5 million in cash. Several years after that, he co-founded the company that evolved into Hoovers.com. And 12 years later, that company was bought by Dun & Bradstreet for $117 million. He was the first entrepreneur in residence at the University of Texas Macomb Business School. And he now serves as the executive director of the American Business History Center. Gary lives in Flatonia, Texas, among his 60,000 volume book library. And for those of you who came on late, Flatonia is on I-10 between Houston and San Antonio, about halfway and about 71 miles southeast of Austin. Gary, welcome. The floor is yours. Uh, great. Thanks, Jim. Well, here. Uh, yeah, well, uh, uh, those are all very nice words, uh, kind words from uh, Dr. Butler and uh, everybody. I do have to add, after those two successful companies, which I had lots of investors, I didn't own the whole things, I had a big failure and I lost all the money I made on the first two. I went into the uh, travel business and learned a lot about it. Um, and, and I'd also mention, uh, my friends and I have this uh, website, AmericanBusinessHistory.org, which is devoted to studying business history. We write uh, newsletters every week or two. We've done, I think, going on 150 of them, stories from business history. But included on that, uh, if you uh, use the search box, you will find both the full history of Bookstop, which really was the most successful business I started you know, my, with my friends, and also the full story of Travel Fest, a two-part story uh, called A Lesson in Entrepreneurial Failure about how I lost all my money and uh, whatever mistakes I might have made and uh, all about that. So I encourage you to read those. Uh, guys, uh, let me start out. As has been mentioned, I've been interested in business a long time. So I grew up in a General Motors factory town, Anderson, Indiana. Anderson was a town of 60,000 people, still is about, and uh, 27,000 people worked at General Motors. We were one of their biggest uh, cities in the world outside of Michigan. And I'm sitting there in the classroom and the teachers are teaching me, uh, us about leadership, uh, management strategies, kings, queens, presidents, generals, colonels, governors, you know, how did they make decisions? How did they lead people? What were their strategies? You know, who won this battle or who lost this battle? You know, all the uh, alliances in European history and all that and how all that worked. And, but really it's about leadership and management. And I'm sitting there in a the classroom and to me, kind of the gorilla in the room or whatever you want to say was General Motors, you know? And I asked the teachers, well, what, can, what about General Motors, you know? And they said, oh, they make Chevrolet, Pontiac, Buick, Oldsmobile, Cadillac, GMC truck, Frigidaire refrigerators. I said, wait, we all know that, you know, everybody in town gets discounts on those General Motors products and everything. And, and, uh, and we all knew the latest car models and all that. Everybody worked at the factory or worked for somebody that serve the factory workers, whether it's a bank or a barber shop. Anyway, I said, but what about the people that lead General Motors, you know? Uh, wh wh who started General Motors? Why did they start it? What was its purpose? Uh, why did it become the biggest automaker in the world and stay there for like 60 years or whatever? Um, you know, who leads it? Are they smart people or stupid people? You know, sometimes we assume everybody that runs a big company is smart, but all you have to do is look at cases like Enron, uh, more recently, Theranos, if you follow that scandal, um, they aren't always smart. The um, CEO of Enron, based in Houston, was top 5% of his class at Harvard Business School. So, you know, one of the most prestigious business schools on earth and top 5%. And he ended up spending 12 years in prison uh, because of, he, he didn't really understand business. With all that education and all those classes and all those books and his superior performance on the test and everything, he never understood business. And so, so I'm you know, fascinated by all this and want to know about General Motors. And as I said, at the age of 12, I'm in a newsstand with my family, my brother and sister buying, uh, my sister is buying the horse or reading the horse and dog magazines, my brother, the airplane and the car magazines. 
and I discovered Fortune magazine, the great business magazine. And every year they do a list of the 500 biggest companies in America called the Fortune 500. That issue was on the newsstand. The biggest company in the world, 50% bigger than any other company was General Motors, uh, also the most profitable big company in the world. And I, I found that magazine. I said, wow, the writers of this magazine are asking the same kind of questions that I'm asking and trying to answer them. And, and also here's this list of 500 companies, not only General Motors, but 499 other giant animals like this, big corporations, uh, most of which I'd never heard of. So I uh, went right to my parents said, you got to get me a subscription to this magazine. They said, oh, you're a weird kid. You know, why don't you go play basketball like a normal Indiana kid? Anyway, I got my subscription and a couple of months later, I entered the seventh grade. I, I now have maybe all but four or five issues, every Fortune magazine since it began in February of 1930, which is a wonderful way to learn about business, going through those old magazines. Anyway, I became obsessed with what separates the winners from the losers in business, but I prefer to word, use the word enterprise or, or venture. And when I say that um, enterprise, I mean any time a group of people get together and have a shared vision, a, a shared purpose, a shared view of the future. And that enterprise, I don't care if it's for profit or not for profit, uh, applies to most government agencies as well. Um, the basic principles of success and failure, I think, are the same, whether you're talking a university, a religion, a corporation, uh, um, a nonprofit, the Red Cross, or whoever you want to pick. Um, and so really, what are the principles of building great enterprises? And from all that and studying it over all these years and practicing it a fair amount and reading a lot, I've got a list of eight things that I think are the keys to building and leading successful enterprises of any type, for profit or nonprofit, although my examples are, are mainly for profit. Um, first thing on my list is curiosity. So soon after I fell in love with business, I fell in love with retailing uh, for a lot of different reasons, but it's, a, it's an easy industry to check out, uh, look into, you know, as a teenager, I was going around to the giant stores of the day J.C. Penney, Sears Roebuck, Kmart, talking to the managers, going to mom and pops, uh, trying to learn about it. But, but over time, and I always ask, oh, what's, what do you like about your job? What don't you like? What's the best day you ever had? The worst day you ever had? What kind of people do you look for in this industry and everything? And, and as I went through all that, I, it, it uh, reinforced my conclusion that I should be in retailing and retailing was a field for me. And it's, I still love it. I, I just wrote an email about 15 minutes ago about thinking about uh, applying for a job at Walmart just sent it to some of my closest friends we were talking about life in our in our 70s and I was like well you know just to get back into a retail store it, it would be worth it you know if I get part-time job at Walmart or something uh anyhow so I love retailing and and over time I realized and I, I work for two giant retailers and I picked retail stocks for a giant New York bank those were three corporate jobs I had between getting out of college and starting book stop that skipped in the bio and um, and as it evolved, I realized, well, I really want to start my own retail chain someday. I think originally I, I thought I'd run one of those existing retail companies, but as I worked in the industry and better understood it, I realized that many times the real advantage goes to the startup, the new idea, uh, without all the old baggage and all that. In any case, so I realized I want to start my own retail chain. And so, as a startup entrepreneur, because I've actually, including failures and ones that didn't get very far and everything, I think my total count is like nine, including three little things when I was a student in college. Um, if you're a startup entrepreneur, you have to look at least 10 to 15 years in the future, because anything worth building is going to take seven, eight, nine, let's say five to 10 years to develop. I mean, once in a while, there's an overnight success. I think, was it in Instagram that sold out for a billion dollars when it was a year old or whatever? But that's very, very rare. If you check Amazon, if you check Google, certainly if you check Apple, took them a long time to get rolling, you know, before you can either go public or sell the company or, or have an enterprise that, that you think is really going to last, you're seven or eight years down the road. Well, you can't go public or sell it or, or keep it and take the dividends if it doesn't have a future then. If it's like goes public when it's eight years old and it's bankrupt at year nine, well, that's not a real good public offering. <laughs> and probably the statements in the IPO uh, prospectus weren't <laughs> completely accurate. You gotta have legs, you gotta have a future out there. So you gotta be looking 10, 10, 10, 15 years in the future. So I'm sitting there in the 1970s trying to foresee the 80s and the 90s. 
Well, the first thing is basically all business economics goes back to demographics. Who are the people? What are their ages, their incomes, their ethnicity, their geography? Where do they live? What cities? Where are they moving? You know, the whole nature of, uh, of society. And so I looked at that and, and uh, I, I said, well, you know, who's, who's going to be uh, the most important factor in consumer spending in the 80s and 90s, in the future, looking at it from the 70s? And clearly it was the baby boom, uh, biggest generation in American history, best educated generation in American history. At that time, we were in our teens and 20s, depending on where you were born in the boom. And when you look at a cohort like that, or like Gen X or Y or any other, the greatest generation, any other group, uh, two things. Uh, what is, which of the attributes of their lives and therefore their spending patterns are um, generation related and which are age related? So for example, when I got to Wall Street in the early seventies, the common wisdom was that adults drink coffee, young people drink soft drinks. And you can tell from the demographics, because demographics is the one thing you can really project five, 10, even 20 years out with a very high degree of accuracy, very rare thing and all the things you're gonna encounter in life, you can project that closely. But hey, the population was aging, so they're gonna to move to coffee. Uh, be, and, and that was the idea that, well, it's age related. You will age out of soft drinks. Well, it turned out not to be true. If you'd bought the big coffee stock, General Foods, you wouldn't have done that well. The company made Maxwell House. They were the dominant coffee company then. Um, on the other hand, if you bought Coke or Pepsi, you would have done much better because in fact, the baby boomers did not change. They stayed with uh, soft drinks at, at that stage of the game before bottled water and rise of Red Bull and a lot of other products. But, and coffee consumption, US was on a long-term, big, serious downslide. Went from, I think, 75% of American adults drank coffee to 50%. And that downslide continued. So they were wrong. It, I, I use a case I want to work with people in their 20s or whatever, video gamers. Well, if it's age related, then when they're 60 years old, they'll have a closet full of old video games they haven't looked at in 40 years. If it's generation related, then they'll have a $50,000 game room when they're 60 years old. You with me? So, and it can be hard to pick. But when I looked at what people are going to be buying, um, you know, I came up with uh, books, records, toys, sporting goods, auto parts, and home improvement. And some of that was age-related, aging baby boom. They were going to get out of college, or even if they didn't go to college, you're going to live in an apartment, fall in love, move the suburbs, have a family, have a station wagon, then later it was a minivan, now it's an SUV. Um, they would have uh, kids and pets, uh, another great category. Um, They'd be working on their houses, cars, and then for the kids, they'd buy toys and sporting goods and on and on. Anyway, so some were age related, and, but generation related, being a baby boomer, I believe uh, high education levels, we'd be readers, a greater degree than our parents were, book readers, also into movies and music more. Now, at the same time, I looked at what's the latest technology in retailing, because that technology is always important. Now, we often think technology means hardware and software and all that, and that's part of it, uh, high tech, I guess. But uh, Milton Friedman in class used to talk about maybe one of the most important technologies in the 20th century is the way that chickens are raised. That, and, I, and I served on the board of directors of Whole Foods Market, so I know there's a lot of pushback now against uh, factory farming. But nevertheless, what Pilgrim's Pride and Tyson's and Purdue did dramatically lowered the world cost of nutrition, of protein, and, and made it more accessible to lots of people. It was a revolutionary kind of thing. Uh, where I live now, uh, Flatonia, our biggest employer, uh, is uh, the nation's largest producer of fresh eggs, Eggland's Best and all that. And I want to say they have something like 3 million hens in the countryside around here. So uh, that thing's still going. But technology is any better way of doing things. The airline hub system, uh, even the nightly news in a sense. Uh, the new technology in retailing that I saw was the invention of the superstore by a man named Charles Lazarus with a concept called Toys R Us in Washington, D.C. in the late 1950s. And that was a retail technology. And what he said is, I'm going to create a chain of stores. They're not going to be general merchandise stores like Walmart or Sears or Macy's that uh, carry a huge, broad range of things. They're going to be specialty stores. They're going to start carry toys and games and bicycles, whatever. And Within that category, I'm going to have a huge selection of products and very low prices, lower than what people are used to. Um, well, today, the idea of the superstore, the biggest superstore chain ever built, is called Home Depot. The next biggest ones are Best Buy and Lowe's. Uh, and you've got Staples. Uh, they go a uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, they go on and on. Uh, Ulta even is a superstore in cosmetics. 
Um, but that idea, Lazarus had. Now we look back on these ideas and we have, uh, 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 sure, obvious, it's, it made sense, sure, uh, obvious. Why didn't somebody think of that earlier? Well, I always say in my entrepreneurship classes, if you have a great uh, an idea and everybody, your friends, I'll tell you, it's the best idea they ever heard, they wish they thought of it, you probably don't have a good idea. 95, 99% of all good ideas are laughed out of the room when they're first brought up. Well, why would we have laughed at Charles Lazarus back in the, in the uh, 60s or 70s and say an economics class at the University of Chicago? Well, if you're gonna carry a huge selection of goods, you're gonna have to rent a bigger room and pay more rent. And you're gonna have to finance that inventory. And that inventory is gonna tend to be slower turning than a smaller inventory of bestsellers when you carry what they call the long tail, the things you only sell one a year of or whatever, that slows your turnover, increases your investment in inventory. So you can't charge lower prices. And in fact, the basic thesis of discount retailing is you carry fewer items. So for example, if Best Buy carries 20 laptops, Walmart, which operates at a, a little lower margin, uh, will carry four and Costco or Sam's, which will operate at the lowest margins in American retailing, the lowest markups, they carry one or two. Uh, the average Walmart, which does around 80 million a year in revenue, carries 120,000 different items. They're called SKUs, SKU, stop keeping units in retailing. Well, so the average Walmart, 80 million a year at 100,000 plus different items. The average Costco carries 3,500 item and items and last year did over $200 million average per store, more than twice the average Walmart. So the magic of that low, low pricing is, man, they cherry pick. They just carry the fastest turning high velocity items and don't carry a whole lot of other stuff. It's a, they have a very short tail, I guess, the statisticians would say. In any case, uh, both approaches can be successful. But the idea that you carry a huge selection and low prices, uh, hey, it just doesn't work. Well, it did work. Lazarus, Toys R Us was selling over half of all the toys sold even in major metropolitan markets like Chicago and Los Angeles. And I saw that technology and said, well, that's too powerful to stay just in toys. That's a really powerful new way of approaching the retail business. And, and so I decided to copy it. And at the same time, I was doing the other analysis, the demographic analysis, and said, so I need to open a superstore and toys, records, sporting goods, books, home improvement, auto parts, whatever the list was. Anyhow, I don't know how to fix a car, build a house, still don't. Um, toys was already taken. I don't generally believe in first mover advantage. Most of the first companies in most industries we've never heard of. I think when Amazon started selling books online, they were maybe the 30th company to do it. The pizza uh, chain industry was dominated by a company called Shakey's. They were the first mover, well-known chain that very few people have heard of now. I think they may still exist in a couple of places. So uh, it's not about being first, it's about being best. And if you can be best and first, that's great, but that's very rare. I mean, my primary example I use is Federal Express where a guy in Yale class got a bad grade for his idea. He went, he used the family money, his inheritance to start Federal Express uh, his, uh, his sister sued him for risking, you know, their inheritance. So he had to buy him out, whatever, 40 years ago. Pro I'm guessing it cost him like $3 billion a piece or his siblings or something. We can figure it out, look it up. In any case, but Federal Express invented an industry and they're the best. UPS came along later and it gives them an incredibly serious challenge to wonderful companies. In any case, so uh, if toys had been doing a bad job of it, I wouldn't have ruled out toys, but I looked at the toy stores. I studied their annual reports. It was one of the fastest growing, most profitable companies in America. Today, you know, it's post peak to put a mildly. Uh, companies follow an arc. I'm not sure which way to run my hand. How about that way? They're born, they grow, and then they tend to die, but they don't always. Both Procter & Gamble and John Deere were found in 1837, celebrating their 185th birthdays this year. Those appear to be companies that are going to last a lot longer than most companies do. But in any case, Toys R Us today is no longer <laughs> a hot growth company with incredible profit. But that's that's the nature of business and the, the arc of companies. In any case, uh, so anyway, I'm looking at all that and I said, I'm going to do superstore books, right? Because I love hanging out in bookstores. I love reading. Um, and, and, you, and you can tell from those demographics that an aging baby boom as their incomes rose, there's a family size rose or the created families uh, in general, they were gonna buy more and more books and that it was gonna be a great industry to be in. So I spent seven years doing the research. I always believe, I call it doing your homework. 
becoming an expert at research in the industry, joining the Industry Trade Association. These days it's easy, or, or just look at their website these days. Read the Industry Trade Press, the trade magazines and publications, all of which today still exist and all of which have websites. I'm on them every day. A lot of them have free newsletters. I bet you I get 10 to 12 email newsletters a day. Update on the hotel industry, update on the airline industry, update on retailing, every industry I'm interested in, consumer products, restaurant industries, all the ones that I follow pretty closely. Um, and go to the industry trade shows. Those are real key ways you understand the industry. Every industry has its jargon. A key thing is to really understand the language of the industry. And the only way to do that is to immerse yourself in the industry. So, and, and try to become the greatest expert you can in your industry. Now that's an awfully high bar. None of us probably ever achieve it. I didn't, but I hung out with the greatest experts in the bookstore and book publishing industry and learned from them. And so seven years of research and Six years into it, I went to the industry trade show. They now call it Book Expo. At that time, well, it would have been 1981. It was in Atlanta, and there were maybe 35,000 people there, booksellers and publishers from around the world. Biggest book show on earth, or one of the two big ones. Uh, Frankfurt, Germany has a giant one, too, but the big U.S. one. And I, I go to that. They have a workshop on the future of bookselling in America, which is what I've been studying for seven years, and I had already come to my own conclusions, was beginning to design the idea for what became Bookstop. And that workshop on the future of book selling in America says, oh, that's where they're going to be talking about book superstores. It's so obvious. It's in the cards. If I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. You can just, you know, read your world almanac, the basic data book on America. It's like 15 bucks comes out every year. I've bought it this day. It came out since 1959 every year. Uh, uh, maybe I missed a couple. Anyhow, um, and, and, I'm a, and, and I go to this workshop and they're talking about we got to worry about book of the month club. Well, that's a 1920s idea that's post peak. We got to worry about Costco and their clones, Sam's. Well, that's the opposite of a superstore. Costco actually does sell enormous dollars worth of books, but it's like 50 titles or 200 titles or whatever. The opposite of a 60,000 title book superstore. When, when existing the dominant chains at the time, each major company, these venture capitalists thought I could never even get near them and we'd be crushed. Uh, you know, they were uh, carrying 5,000 titles in the store and their average store is doing a half a million a year. Uh, after we got book stop rolling, uh, um, it, it went above that. I'll, uh, I'll chat in a second, I guess. Anyhow, um, uh, so, um, and, 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 I, and in that workshop, I'm waiting for them to talk about the book superstore and they never do. And I'm like, what planet are these people on? Have they never been to a Toys R Us? Have they never thought about the implications of that for our industry? People don't look outside their industries. The great breakthrough ideas usually come from somewhere else, from anywhere else. Uh, Peter Drucker, the greatest management thinker who ever lived, or you can make a case for that. You know, at the end of his career in his 90s, he, he wrote up that he thought the best CEO in America was the woman that ran the Girl Scouts of America. That was uh, some, some years ago, probably 20 years ago. But, and he also studied how mega churches are run. So, you know, leader, leadership is leadership. Uh, in any case, I'm sitting there at the book convention. Nobody sees the future coming, except me, I guess. And I'm like, wow, are these people stupid? No, they weren't stupid. They're high IQs, they read a lot. I still love, always loved hanging out with booksellers. I still do, and publishers. And all I figure out is they're a little, they're parochial. They've never been outside their little world. They've never looked. And as I've looked at hundreds of industries, I, I think I have over 300, 350 business ideas on little tablets I keep that I've been keeping since I was a kid. Looked at all these industries. It's really true that the many or maybe most of the so-called leaders in all these industries have their head in the sand. They're so caught up in this, especially these larger enterprises, big companies and big nonprofit organizations, thing, so caught up in their internal politics, their internal jargon, um, that they aren't out looking around. And that was true of the bookstore people. They hadn't, and like I say, Toys R Us is a public company. You could get their annual report. You could complete, really read all this stuff and understand how that whole, what the business model was to use a more current term. Well, they just weren't curious. Well, all these people, all these companies, they just aren't curious enough, you know? The curiosity is missing. And, I, and I've got eight points on my list of key things. Number one, curiosity. I go on a lot longer than any of the others because I believe it underlies all success. So next thing, what are you curious about? Well, um, uh, first thing, uh, 
curious about history, have a sense of history. And there I mean a couple things. Um, it's really about understanding change through time. So one of the things is to learn from history. I keep a list on my computer I call it Answers from Detroit. Well, every high tech leader deals with a list of issues. Uh, should we listen to the investors or Wall Street, plot in our future, or listen to the engineers and product designers? Should we make one product, millions of it, or should we customize each thing we make, whether it's hardware or software, to the customer's needs? Does design matter? Can we just make an ugly thing and blow it out the door, or does it matter how it looks? That was a big difference between General Motors and Ford, which allowed General Motors to blow by Ford in 1927. And that was a huge difference between Apple and all of their competitors. All these issues that tech people deal with, every single one of them was confronted, dealt with by Alfred P. Sloan, the greatest business leader in history, in my opinion, who built General Motors, um, Walter Chrysler and Henry Ford, his two main competitors. And not that the answers today will be the same, but often they are. And even when they aren't, there's a great deal to be learned from them. So um, one thing is studying history. Any industry you go into, study the history of that industry. Any company you're going to sell to, any government organization you're going to sell to, study their history. Why was it invented? Who was it invented? When was it invented? How old was it? How close are they today to that original purpose they set? Understand that context. Everything is about understanding context. And so study history, your industry. Why does it exist? Why do people even have bookstores? Why do people even have trucking companies? What's their role in the economy? The big picture kind of things. And then the other thing is watching trends. Every aspect, every community, every business has micro trends, but there are also giant trends. And so, for example, in retailing in the 20th century, the biggest, most important factor was the entry of women into the workforce. We went around the time of World War I, it was something like 20% of American women had a daytime job. And I think it got up to about 70% by the 90s, something like that. Anyway, huge shift. And it had all kinds of implications for uh, 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 childcare and house, housekeeping and on and on and on. But one of the things it said is that people no longer shop Monday through Friday, nine to five. They shop nights, weekends, and lunch hour. Well, the banking industry hired hundreds of thousands of women and never knows when they've gone to work. They still close at five o'clock on Friday. And you're lucky they're open until noon on Saturday. The travel agency industry that I went into, two thirds of the people in it are women. And yet a long hour travel agency, one that has really long hours, is open Saturday to like one or 2 p.m. The peak of the retail spending week is two to 4 p.m. Saturday. That's when people have discretionary spending. These people are just not, they don't understand their own world, you know? And um, um, these trends and these demographic trends, you know, we know how many 80 year olds will live in Travis County 10 years from now, pretty darn close. We, we have a much better idea of that number than we do of where the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, uh, the next Longhorns football game or interest rates will be in six months, you know, uh, things that we talk about all the time that we don't have a clue. And yet they're these big things and you can place bets on them because because, you know, where people are going to live and what age and their and some sense of their incomes you have uh, over the longer pool. You've got this uh, idea and you can, you know, we, we build a company book stop. I guess I finished that one. So the average bookstore did about half a million. We had to do a million dollars a year to break even because we had a bigger store and bigger inventory. I told investors the first store in Northwest Austin, September of 1982, 40 years ago this year, uh, would do 1.4 million. And we did 1.8. And within a few years, our average store was doing 3 million. And Barnes & Noble, those people bought B. Dalton, the big giant before us for $300 million. Uh, ended up closing the entire national chain and taking a $300 million write-off and buying us for $40 million, and that was their future. Then they started to build a giant Barnes & Noble stores, but that's, you can read all about that on the site. So uh, a, a sense of history, a sense of how things change through time, of the trends, how it's evolving. And again, like I say, the micro trends in, your, in Austin and in your industry, in your business. Um, and next, uh, so be curious, have a sense of history. Third thing, a sense of geography. The internet age, it's, you know, here, oh, place doesn't matter anymore. If you go back to my old Fortune magazines in the 1950s or 60s or 70s, really, almost every ad told where that company was headquartered. Ford Motor, Dearborn, Michigan, American Express, New York, New York, Coca-Cola, Atlanta, Georgia. 
Well, with 800 numbers and everything else, I went through one even by the 90s, like 10% of them showed where they're from. And it's like, well, place doesn't matter. Place matters as much as it ever has in history. Every person on earth was born somewhere. Every person on earth was raised somewhere. We're shaped by it. I was going to make a speech in Australia and I said, we can't do it then. We have a test. Well, what do you mean? Oh, it's a cricket match. It lasts like a week and the country shuts down. I, hey, till the day I die, I will love auto racing, IndyCar racing like the Indianapolis 500, and I will love basketball. I didn't pick either one of those things. Both of those things come from the fact I grew up in Indiana. I didn't pick them. I don't have a choice in that one, you know, uh, not much. Anyhow, so people, where they live, why they live there, why they're moving. If you go to the AmericanBusinessHistory.org website, uh, uh, some of the times we depart from telling the story of a great entrepreneur or business leader or their company or their industry is uh, uh, we have a lot of stuff on there about American migration, what cities people are moving to, even right up through recently. Um, do and also long-term charts. We have one animated chart that shows the growth and death of American cities from the 1790s to the 21st century. And you can watch as they die and rise and fascinating stuff. Anyhow, um, and, and so history and geography, one way to think about all that is an entrepreneur's greatest advantage is often their awareness of where they are in time and space. And that sounds like Star Trek or Star Wars or something, but to have some idea of what's gone before you, you can only understand the future by understanding the past. Steve Jobs said, you cannot connect the dots looking forward, only backward. Winston Churchill said, the further backward you look, the further forward you can see. If you're gonna predict 10 years in the future, you gotta be looking 10 to 20 years backwards in time to draw that curve, to connect the dots. Um, and so some sense of where you're at in time, because it's the only way you're gonna see the future or some glimpse of it, and where you're at in space, you know, where you're at in Austin. Uh, um, you know, I, uh, gosh, when I moved there 40 years ago, uh, um, nobody ever would have lived in Elgin or Bastrop, except the people that were already there, you know, but all the growth was West. And that I noticed, hey, we're putting an airport over there on that other side of town. That's gonna have a long-term effect. All you'd have to do would see to study how DFW affected Dallas and Fort Worth over the years, look at 20 years before they built it and 20 after whatever and see and look to the day where it's had just enormous effect on the growth. And DFW will pass up Chicago to become the third biggest metropolitan area in the country by 2050, probably late 2040s. It's looking like a first change in the ranking of the top three in a hundred years. Uh, so important stuff and it'll get headlines when that time comes. A lot of this stuff I'm talking about, I realize it's very big picture, but if you read the newspapers and you watch TV and everything, you're gonna hear about the tsunamis and earthquakes uh, of economics, of business, of, of, of government even. No, what you got, and that, yeah, that's great. You gotta be aware of that. But the key is understanding the plate tectonics, the stuff underneath that causes earthquakes and uh, volcanoes. I just took a big trip out to Big Ben with studying geology and come home with all these expensive plate tectonic sex books. But plate tectonics in the economy are key. And those are the kind of things I'm thinking about. The other thing I'd, I'd mention is every entrepreneur, every business leader who's doing an even a halfway decent job is buried. Everyone looks at their to-do list and looks like, oh, I ought to go hang myself. I can never get this done. We're all buried. The difference between the larger thinkers is that they take that carve out time to look at the big picture. Bill Gates used to take a week a year off when he, was, when he was active CEO of Microsoft and go in the woods and read a stack of books. I knew the Wilman who picked the books for him. They weren't about business. He was in broad reap. John Mackey, the Whole Foods founder, at least for years and may still do it, he read two hours every morning before he went to work to take that time to read the front page of the Wall Street Journal each day, digitally or you know, print copy. Uh, to take that time on uh, Sunday afternoon to read The Economist each week. Um, uh, taken just a little, because so few people do it. So anyway, three points. Be curious, history, geography. That leads me into, I'm probably burning through my time here. Um, go a little faster. Leads, from that you evolve a vision, a purpose. Business is all about what's your purpose. So I think your purpose or vision or mission they all overlap or maybe the same thing.
to be clear, be consistent, be serving and unique. Be clear. Drop the buzzwords. Drop the jargon. Uh, I guess maybe you got to use some of your industry jargon if you're real specific about your goals. But, you know, so many corporate mission statements are just a bunch of BS, a bunch of meaningless words. Um, all these companies try to copy Southwest Airlines and then they go out and do it. Most all of them went broke, the true original copiers uh, that were tried by Delta and United and all these guys. Southwest, you know, hey, we fly one kind of airplane, 737, so uh, limited investment in spare parts. All the crews are trained on the same aircraft, uh, all, all these benefits. Uh, we throw peanuts at you, we tell you a joke and take off. And, you know, it was the only Amer US based airline that was consistently profitable decade after decade, by far the best. Uh, financial performance and, and for the customers as well. Uh, reputation for great value. And, but then people went and copied it and they couldn't even Xerox right. They had four kinds of airplanes. They had first class, they had this and they had that and they all died. And they said, oh, it's too simple. You know, it can't be that simple. No, if you have a business idea, take it to your grandmother or any reasonably bright sixth grader and tell them about it. If they can't understand it, you can't understand it. I've never seen a venture capitalist walk away from an idea because they understood it, because it was plain English. And having witnessed probably tens of thousands of business plans and pitch contests and everything, often it's just buried in jargon and undecipherable. So um, be clear. Next thing, be consistent. Now, in the early stages of an enterprise, often you have to change path or you discover a new market or you find, well, this is really where we should be. These days, the buzzword for that is that you pivot. But once you figure out what it is you're good at and once you've really got it rolling, great enterprises tend to do the same thing incredibly well day after day, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, and focus on that thing. That doesn't mean they don't innovate. Innovation is key, uh, that they don't adapt. But, and, and when they get big, they may branch out. I talk a lot about UPS, which I believe is one of the greatest companies on earth. One of the largest companies on earth run by a woman. It is more valuable than the entire passenger airline industry as far as its market cap. It is the largest and most valuable transportation companies on earth. Well, they've moved into logistic services. They will set up like a repair department for your computer company next to their hub in Louisville or, or help work with you. Uh, they'll help you plan use of their competitors, even if it works in how you need to move your stuff. But still, at their heart, they are the company that delivers packages. It was started in 1907 by a 19-year-old kid who borrowed $100 and lived to his 90s and spent his life building that company. You can read his biography, Jim Casey and UPS, on our business history site. Amazing guy who almost nobody's heard of, except everyone in UPS. Every driver at UPS knows about Jim Casey, and he's been dead for years. Uh, um, consistency of vision. Um, a, a quick example on that, Boeing. Oh, we're not a, uh, a manufacturing or we're a services company. This is 30 years ago, maybe. Oh, we're not a Seattle company anymore. We're a Chicago company. And now they just announced they're going to be a bit Washington, D.C. company. Um, they used to have be squeaky clean for their ethics. All of a sudden, 20, 30 years ago, they're being investigated by Congress or screwing around on defense contracts and stuff. They lost their way. It cost their stockholders billions of dollars. They said, oh, we're a services company, not a manufacturing company. Whatever sounded good to Wall Street. And, and that cost their success. And they fell from being the biggest maker of air, airliners, airframes, they call them, in the world, to number two, to Airbus, a consortium of European governments. You know, Finally, they got rid of that idiot Boeing. They got back on track. They became number one again, but they're still stumbling around. from Moline, Illinois to Chicago, you know, O'Hare Airport, easier to recruit talent. No, no, no. They stay in Moline. They are a big green tractor e company, which has branched into construction equipment and every other kind of tool you can use, including garden tractors. But like I said, they're on their 10th CEO in 185 years. I can't find any business professors that really study average longevity at the top. But I think that says a tremendous amount about them. Be clear, be consistent. Big one, serving. So I get to Wall Street, 1973. I'm a kid retail analyst, a veteran, old, one of the top analysts in Wall Street. He was called the Prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, because of his uh, accuracy in predicting how stocks were going to do in retailing. And he'd been at a big brokerage house. Citibank had hired him to become their vice president. He hired me. I learned a huge amount from old Pete Wetzel. 
and 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 a big stocks 1973 that we owned were Sears, Penny, and Kmart, and and uh, but I had the shoe stores, the grocery stores, uh, the the department stores, all these other types of retailing. He let me cover. He covered the our huge investments, and he comes in one day and says, "Gary, the boss has given us given us a budget. Hire a summer intern. They would work for you, Gary, giving you management experience." But they've got to look at some category of retailing as so small and insignificant that not only is it not worth the boss Pete's time, it's not even worth Gary, the guy that's just been here uh, less than a year's time. Some small segment, but one segment of retailing that might someday compete with our other investments, Sears, Penny, and Kmart, or get big enough we can buy stock in them because a company has to be at a certain size before a huge institutional investor can participate in it easily. Certainly, that was an issue then. And he said, Gary, do you think uh, we should bring a summer intern in to work for you to cover these regional discount store chains? There were like 31 of them. Coons, Big K, More Value, Alco, Duckwall, Ames, Walmart, Fedmart, Caldor, all over the United States. Regional chains doing business in one, two, three states. And Pete said, Gary, go home, think about it. Let's get back together, get in a couple of days and decide. We got back together. No, we just said, no. Uh, and we were the best and the brightest, you know? And we said, no, come on. Why even bother look at this wall, whatever it is, Bentonville, Arkansas. If they ever get to a big city and try to compete with Kmart, they will be demolished. We'll lose our jobs because our bosses are virus for buying Walmart stock. You know, a Kmart stock would be going through the roof. Well, and I'll tell you, I was wrong. If you had put $10,000 into Walmart stock when they went public about 1970, it'd be worth over hundred million a day. If you had waited 10 years till they were a billion dollar company and put in 10,000, it would still be worth something like, I think 30 million a day, you know? So we were real wrong. What do we miss? Look back at 1973. I, usually I work with a whiteboard, so you're gonna have to work with my hands here. Compare on the one hand, what Sears Roback had, the biggest retailer on earth, and on the other hand, I'm not going to get this right. There we go. <laughs> Walmart, which was insignificant. And it was one one hundredth the size of Sears. It was one fiftieth the size of Kmart in 1973. So study and management book, whatever. What matters? Okay, which company had more experienced management? Sears. Which company paid less for real estate? Sears. Which company had better consumer brand awareness, craftsman tools, uh, Cold Smart, Kenmore, uh, 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 other uh, brands, craftsman? Um, uh, diehard batteries, you know, who had better brand awareness, uh, Sears, who had better uh, locations, Sears, uh, who had better human resources um, uh, uh, planning, who had better compensation structures, uh, who had better consultants, who had better lawyers, who had better computer systems, go on and on and on. Every single one of them, Sears, 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 not one of, not one of the attributes was in Walmart's favor. And Walmart today, well, uh, I've talked about it so many times. You say, well, Walmart's now 30 times as big as Sears. Well, now it's infinite times as big as Sears because Sears is gone, man. <laughs> Sears is zeroed out, you know? And how did that happen? How it happened is Sears took its eye off the customer. Sears uh, said, we got to get into uh, uh, stock brokerage, bought Dean Winter. We got to get into real estate. We bought Coldwell Banker, created the Discover card. They had to, the people, and I, I never met Sam Walton, but I had lunch with the CEO of Sears several times because we were one of their biggest stockholders. Me and Pete meeting with all those people. People ran all state and everything. They had to at some level be saying in the back of their heads, we are the biggest, most profitable retailer on earth, most successful retailer on earth. That was all true. We can do this with one hand tied behind our back. And maybe they thought their business was no longer challenging and so, well, study Walmart. Every decision Sam Walton made was based on how can I make life for my friends and neighbors better? He was so pissed off that all of his friends had to drive an hour and a half into a bigger city to go to Kmart to get a reasonable price on things. That the, that the small merchants they dealt with were overpricing things. And you, all you had to do is go to, a, go to Little Rock or whatever and get your bargains. And why can't smaller communities have access to this increase in you know, um, the cost savings and, you know, the rest is history. That gets more complex than that. I could talk hours and hours about Walmart, but the, the bottom line, and I use retailing because I love it and I know it, but we could talk about Sears versus Toyota. I mean, GM versus Toyota. We could talk about U.S. Steel versus Nucor. We could talk about IBM versus Apple 
and Microsoft. Now, IBM survived by, you know, kind of changing around a lot. But <laughs> the basic thing is it's about the customers. My great professor, Milton Friedman, eh, kind of said the purpose of a company is to make a profit. I don't agree with that. Read on my, my other website, Hoover's World has a post 10 myths about profit. And I go into depth about why Friedman said that and why I disagree with it and so on. And, and a lot more stuff on profit, and what it means, the role it plays in society. The only valid purpose for inter, any enterprise is to provide goods and services to somehow make someone's life better. It's not there for the shareholders. It's not there for the employees. It's not there for the community. Only if it serves its customers can it be a good community citizen and contribute to the community. Can it be a good customer for its suppliers? And can it provide jobs? And certainly, can it be a worthwhile investment? Um, a study of the biography on our web history website of Robert Wood, the guy that built Sears. He, in the 1930s, he was espousing all those things I'm talking about. Or read Peter Drucker. He had a lot in common. Read John Mackey's work, Conscious Capitalism. A lot of overlap and all that. Clear, consistent, serving. Serving's a big one. Uh, unique. Uh, great enterprises march to their own drummer. Whole Foods, at least when I was on the board, may still be true. Uh, teams could fire people without telling their boss. They could hire people without telling their boss. If they were all working too hard and never seeing their families, they could add a person. If they had a gold brick, you know, or whatever, somebody didn't do their job, seven of them working together, to get rid of the seventh and six of them do the work. And their pay system made it uh, incentives for that. So, yeah, if you got rid of the seventh, you would all make more pay and split the money six ways. But also, if you add in an eighth, if you needed it, and we're more productive. That's all key of, of Costco, you know. Costco, they make 10%, essentially, is the difference in what they pay for stuff and they sell it for. It's the lowest margin all of retailing around the world. And Sam's is very similar. And, uh, but Costco is the highest paying retailer in America. Those clerks are making 50, 60 grand a year after a couple of years there. Um, and it's because they are so productive. Southwest Airlines, known for great value, also has some of the highest paid flight attendants and pilots last I checked. Um, but your own drummer, a, a bizarre voice, company I know, Brett Hurt, who followed me as entrepreneur in residence uh, at McCombs, uh, one of the companies he built was Brett Hurt, uh, it was a bizarre voice, a public, became a public company. They had no vacation policy. They said, how can I know whether you should take a week off or eight weeks off? I don't know. Only you know what you need. All they cared about is here's your monthly, quarterly, annual goals. Did you make them? They have legendary stories about their top salesperson being traveling in northern India and from a a boat on the, up in Kashmir or whatever, the lake up there by Srinagar, and on the phone making the biggest sale in the company's history uh, to some corporate client in the United States or England or wherever. Um, but every enterprise is unique and marches to its own drummer. And in, in entrepreneurial ventures, often that's a, a long reflection of the shadow of the founder. Clear, consistent, serving, and unique. My eighth and last thing is passion. Life is too short if you don't love it. I've just seen too many people that, that, hey, they go into all this because they want to get rich. When I was an entrepreneur in residence down the hall from uh, 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 Dr. Butler's office, um, and the first question I ask is, why do you want to be an entrepreneur? If they said, well, to get rich, then I'm like, well, you've come to the wrong office. You know, if you want to get rich, come on, go to the pharmacy school and become a great pharmacist and, and I don't know, buy a lot of CVS stock or something. Become a residential real estate broker. You don't even need a friggin' college degree. Go out and become the best salesperson in Westlake Hills. You know, keep at it for 10 years. You're going to end up living in a really big, beautiful house and making a good living. Keller Williams, at least at one point when I talked to people over there a few years ago, the, at least they were then the biggest of the big residential real estate office. 10,000 of their brokers make over a million dollars a year personal income. 10,000. Uh, there are a lot of ways to make money. And then, then the other thing I'd ask if somebody said that, I'd say, why do you want to get rich? And, and then I would get that deer in the headlights look. And, and I've always felt I am really doing my job when I say something and the other person says to me, nobody's ever said that to me before. And most time when I ask, why do you want to get rich? Nobody's ever said that to them before. Uh, real people, and as you go through life, you understand there's a different, hey, I was a millionaire once and I live on social security. Um, so it goes. But uh, um, Anyhow, <laughs> I think uh, I, I ran way, way over, but I think I got through my eight points and hopefully you have some staggering, embarrassing questions for me or <laughs> interesting anything, things to add or whatever works for you folks. I'm at your mercy. Well, Gary, thanks a whole lot.
it was it's very very interesting and as you always are, are very very interesting and i really like the emphasis on change what we have here is we have strategies for companies and being the best and serving the customer is what we try to do and we've gone for two 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 different two different angles number one as you know for me to get a contract from, from, from Whole Foods when you're on the board or when you get a contract from your big box, you had to every, have everything in order. But the other thing is you have to be a great, 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 great business. And we have tried to stress the fact that we have great enterprises and every point that you made uh, for them to be a great enterprise as they move toward what they try to do. That's great. Yeah. Um, we do have a question in the chat that I was going to read out, if that's all right, Mr. Hoover. Um, oh, sure. So the question is, how do you view or relate small business enterprise to who may or may not be single or multi-generational, but stays in a well-defined lane of smallness and can currently provide dependable service and independence for so many business owners creating an independent, well-lived life? Well, I think there's a lot there and needless to say, I have studied, worked with, mentored um, every type of business and every type of business motivation from what they call lifestyle businesses, being out on the speaking circuit and go to, you know, I, I meet lots of uh, other speakers and man, they're some of the happiest people on, uh, on earth, but they're, they're one person company in many cases or two people, although one of the great speakers based in Austin. He called me up when he's 13 and says, I want to become a big speaker someday. And I gave him tips. He calls me back later. He's 40. He's got a staff of 30 people just booking his speeches. So you never know. But the, the I think you, you got to start with what you want to achieve in life. So when I started Bookstop, I already had a map showing hundreds of them all across the U.S. or whatever. I mean, from the outset. And I would never been able to raise the money I needed to raise the way I was, because it was designed as chain retailing, which means you lose money for several years while you build enough stores to cover the cost of your corporate central overhead, the buying organization, the distribution centers, whatever. And, and so that whole thing, you know, if I'd open, if I'd said, I'm just going to open one store, I would have never raised the money. And if I'd said, uh, oh, are we open the one store? I said, oh, I've changed my mind. Now I'm just going to stick with the one. Sam Walton had an agreement with his wife that they would never go beyond, it was either six or seven stores. And he later had to renegotiate the agreement because she wanted him to slow down. And, you know, they've gone to 5,000 or whatever after he's gone. Um, so I, the first thing is what you want to achieve. Now, having said that, there's a lot of truth in the phrase grow or die. There is, there is no such thing as a stable business, right? And so growth is there anyway. And e even if you don't do anything else, you know, inflation alone, you know, your revenues this year are going to be up 8% if you're in line with the overall economy. You got a gas station, they're up a lot more than that, even if all you got is one gas station. But the, the zeros get longer, you know? A giant corporation in America 150 years ago was the one that did 10 million a year, you know? And now that's like uh, falls off the truck at these big companies or whatever, that's like pocket change or to an Elon Musk. So I, I grow, and, and the other thing I would say is as you do your business, and, and so let me make it clear, I am growth oriented. I, I, well, I'll come back later. I rarely consider just having a small business keeping it that way. But the, when you have outside investors, it changes everything. So there's your a key decision point, you know, not just your control, but also the future. Because if you have outside investors, they're going to want to return on their investment. So it's got to have a, it's got to grow. It's got to produce future cash flows that, that grow. Um, but if you don't have outside investors, the other thing that I see, because I have advised and competed with a lot of independent retailers, single store retailers and I go in them every day and I compare them and I love the great ones and I don't like the ones that aren't well run. But a challenge there is what's the upside for the people working for you? When Bookstop would roll into a city, the managers of all the independent stores would come to us because they had no equity in the place they worked. And the only way they could ever get promoted was to buy out the owner or wait for him to die or whatever. And usually it was the owner's kids in there, you know, so they'd all come to us and they, they got stock options in the company. They became owners. They became uh, key and they could go up and up and up. I could, I could look at cashier in the eye, say, look, if you do a good job within two years, you'll be a store manager. 
and we were building stores fast enough I could deliver on those promises. So there's a lot to growth that doesn't get credited when people talk about growth. They tend to think, oh, it's all about for the shareholders and making them rich. The shareholders love it too. So I think there's a lot of issues if you decide not to. Having said that, um, let's turn and, and if you're in the Austin area, Precision Camera built by a man and his wife over a period of 30, 40 years. They finally sold a couple years ago because they're getting up years. They give a lot of money to the Austin Symphony. They have made a shitload, pardon my language, of money <laughs> uh, with one camera store in Austin, Texas, then about three or four different locations. And the whole US camera store industry has died. I gave a speech to their whole convention once and I looked at all the members, most of them were closing up. They're one that figured out how to make it work, rare. Um, bicycle sport shop. I'll just name some of the ones I know on South Lamar. I think they have a second location, maybe Northwest, maybe more now. Incredibly well run. They can compete with any chain bicycle store in the world because those owners love their business and love their customers. They love the product they sell and it shows. Book people, independent bookstore. And, and I could show you articles all about book stuff, how we drove so many out of business. When we opened a big new store in South Austin, <coughs> book people opened a new bigger one across the street from us because, and they had a different business model. They had a different approach and a slightly different customer. They differentiated themselves, but most important, they had self-confidence in what they did. They believed in themselves and, and they, they weren't petrified by us. They came into our stores every day. My partner tried to kick the owner out, said, look, he's writing down all our prices and titles. And I said, oh no, that's, that's good sport. I do that and our competitors let him do it. And, and he and I are still good friends. Um, and book people is still a multi-million dollar independent bookstore. And I'm sure we could find others, you know, <coughs> but Whole Foods starts one store, but he had the ambition to make it big. And he bought up, I want to say they bought up, not he, 30 other natural food stores around the country. Some changed some just a store or two because they loved the business, but didn't love the business side of it. Didn't like dealing with lawyers and accountants and going public. John Mackey was great at all that. He said, look, I'll take that off your shoulders. You can focus on healthy, natural, selling healthy, natural foods and get whole food stock. And so, he, you know, made a lot of people very, very rich by doing that. So I think the whole issue of whether to grow and then how fast to grow, because you're going to grow no matter what, even if it's still in one office or one business. If you're going to survive, you're going to grow. And that's a hard decision. Venture capitalists tend to put the accelerator to the metal and drive the car off the cliff and like oh develop all this overnight build a thousand stores overnight and then you go broke and you know no always pointing the finger at at, at all the people who were saying oh go 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 growing at the right rate for your organization your people your ability to grow your ability to learn and and running a 10 person company is very different from a hundred is very different from a thousand is very different from one and 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 most people most entrepreneurs a venture capitalist fired me at Bookstop, right before Barnes and Noble bought it. And they thought it was time to get somebody who's got more experience at companies of this size. Now, I could argue with them if I wanted. I, I couldn't and didn't, or, you know, too late now. Um, but hey, Steve Jobs lost his job and he came back. Other people, the Bill Gates of the world, to me, are amazing. You know, the one, and the guy, the men and women of all races that I wrote up our business history biographies, they were people that could both create an idea and then continue to run it even as it got huge. And that's really an exceptional combination of skills. Yeah, Gary, let me add to that. My good friend, Aggie friend, Bobby Jenkins of ABC. Started oh yeah, out. yeah. Oh. My Family friend, owned business. Thunder Clouds, Thunder Clouds is under the, is under the radar. And, uh, but I think it's a great question. You know, when do you grow like that? I always like to use the idea of entrepreneur firms because we remember when Mike Adele was two people, he did not want to grow when he was out at, uh, you know, at 183 in Burnett Road. Yeah, I stopped in there. Yep. Great question. Yes. We have another and, question. And perpetuating oh. with the family, you know, that's, man, how you set that up and are the kids really interested and will they do a good job? Uh, right. Uh, we have one more question um, and then I'll hand it back over to Dr. Butler. Um, but uh, so Usha, o Osha asked, um, thank you, Gary, for your insights. Could you suggest how important to focus on processes to scale the business, strategies that scale a business? Um, and she also noted that she really liked your view on customer service and goods and employee centric culture. Uh, yeah. Yeah, hey, all it is is people, picking people, putting the right person in the right job, 
developing people, you know, everything, even dealing with boards and stockholders. It's all just people forget people forget how human all this is. Um, and and uh, what, uh, 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 what was the question? So um, how could you suggest how important to focus on processes to scale the business? What yeah. are strategies? No, to scale? You know, um, you know, I would uh, read a lot, look around. I don't know all the the uh, the best books. One that I really do like is called Scaling Up by Vern Harnish, V-E-R-N-E, -E, last name H-A-R-N-I-S-H. -H. Vern, um, gosh, I've known Vern maybe 30 years. He is one of the smartest people on earth. He's worked closely with Michael Dell and everybody. And his expertise is how to grow a business. And it's the only man workshop I ever took my whole management team for to. And all the people found a rack space in the early days. They were at that same session. I remember the big San Antonio outfit that's done pretty well. Um, and, and he has very specific methods, ways you meet every day in some companies. The, in fact, the entire company meets even when they're all over the world in some of his you know, versions, because he gives you a lot of choices. But he has a balanced way of keeping your eyes on the short-term goals and the long-term goals and always keeping in mind what's important. He has little spreadsheets and everything. His original book was called Mastering the Rockefeller Habits because he'd studied the habits of the great John Rockefeller, who, who was a brilliant businessman. He doesn't always get a lot of credit for that. And, but it's evolved. His last book's called Scaling Up. And, and that's what it's all about, is how, really kind of how do you go from 10 million to 500 million, or the, kind of that range. In fact, he told me he would not, he does all this heavy duty consulting, gets paid a ton of money. But he said, well, was he won't even talk to a company that has over 500 employees because the bureaucracy strangles him and nobody listens, something along those lines. But the smaller companies do listen. I could give you the names of five or 10 businesses in the Austin area to tell you they wouldn't be around today if it weren't for Vern Harnish. Four Hands, a big furniture importer. There have been a bunch of them. Um, uh, so that, that's certainly a book worth looking into. And he may have uh, um, in the book, um, Bibliography, other books to lead you to. And I put a link to that book and its website in the chat for folks that Great. read that. Great. Let, me, let me just add to that. When, when, when Gary was my entrepreneur in residence, Gary filled up the ATT center and he gave the growth of every industry, whether it's a railroad industry, the automobile industry, the, the shirt industry, and he had the ATT Center packed as my entrepreneur in residence every time that he spoke. So if you go to his webpage, if you were interested, for example, in the automobile industry, for people who are interested in getting contracts with, uh, with Tesla, mm -hmm. go and look at how he scaled and all of the things that he did for McCombs when he was entrepreneur in residence. And when he would come out, it was like, it was packed. We could not, we had to almost move to the stadium to, to, to make sure that everybody could come here, Gary. So Gary, don't forget about all the work you've done on how every industry that, that uh, in America have scaled. Yeah, thanks, John. And if you wanna see those videos, if you go to AmericanBusinessHistory.org, you'll see in the menu, either up at the top or if you're on a cell phone, smartphone, it'll be in the menu, the hamburger menu called videos. And if you go to the videos page and scroll down, because those were done 10 years ago, the older ones are towards the bottom, but you'll scroll down, you'll see roughly one hour videos each that were shot live on the history of the media industry, airlines, movies, automobiles, retailing, and computers. And I hope to do more. It's been on my list to do the restaurant industry next, but, but they are really pretty exhaustive histories of, of the American industry in, in each of those categories. And, and it's all visual. It's really, I want to say they're up to 400 color pictures in an hour. I mean, it's really a slideshow, you know, with me standing on the stage in front of it. Because I really, and all of our articles on American Business History Center are very visual. And, and I've got a book, go to Amazon, Bedtime Stories. That's if you like printed books like I do, Bedtime Business Stories, Short Sagas of Business Creation, Success, and Failure. And it's just 34 of the stories that we've written for the web history website, but it's a really nice, handy size to take on a plane with you or read in bed. And, now, and they're, they're very diverse, very diverse stories. I have a deal with Gary Hoover. Hoover. When he, whenever he comes speaks to my student, he can serve as a free consultant 
he gives out his he gives out his email address. If you have a if you have a question about anything, send it to him. And for yeah. the privilege for the privilege of speaking at the University of Texas, he gets to work his butt off for you in the future. <laughs> and yeah, my email is my name without the ER. So G A R Y H O O V at msn.com. And I'm only with them because I refuse to change my email address. <laughs> I lose too many, tr lose track of too many people that way. So Gary Hoove at msn.com. Or if you go to Hoover's World or AmericanBusinessHistory.org and hit contact, because that comes straight to, to me, same address. And yeah, it, once you hear me or see me or whatever we're doing in the Zoom world, um, you get free lifetime 24 seven email support, but it's my lifetime, not your lifetime. So you know, <laughs> don't come digging up my grave and asking me silly questions <laughs> or even good questions. <clears throat> Oh. Well, thank you so much. That wraps up our, our question and answer time. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Butler now. Thank you very much. This is our last meeting. And right now you will have a certificate from the University of Texas at Austin. And as Gary Hoover would tell you, it's all about the networking that you have. The reason why people pay hundred thousand dollars to go to Garrett's alma mater is to meet all of the networking that you can have and the people that you have. We would like to say that we have the same kind of process from now on, from now on, you're members of the University of Texas family. And as we give the certificate, I want you to remember the following words and treasure them as long as you live. The eyes of Texas are upon you all the live long day. Hook them. The eyes of Texas are upon you, and you cannot get away. <laughs> Do not think you can escape them from night till early in the morning, because the eyes of Texas are upon you until Gabriel blows his horn. <laughs> it is the most recognized. I've been in Japan, I've been in China, I've been everywhere in Europe, and I would have my Texas shirt on and somebody would come up and say, hook them, hook them, Longhorns, Longhorns. It is the most recognized symbol. So right now you are part of the Longhorn family. That means that you have taken a certificate from the University of Texas at Austin. So if we're, if we're at graduation, I would say, welcome, to the Longhorn family, continue to do great, do great things. And as you build your company and continue to do great things, I don't care if you're an Aggie, I don't care if you're a Tiger, I don't, I don't care if you went to Texas Tech or Southwest Texas or Texas State, right now you have also been branded as a Longhorn. So, James, Garrett, are we gonna? Are we gonna do? Oh, because we're virtual now, we can't do the <laughs> the certificates. How will we get the certificates to people? So I've I've put in the chat a link to make sure you do receive your certificate, and I sent it out in an email. And I'll send a reminder as well. But there's just a quick form to put in your your forwarding address, and we will make sure we get you your 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 certificate. And we would like to thank you for joining in this long line education. And we know. In, in managerial science, and as Gary will tell you, education, business is a long, long process. You are always- I always I, If I can add, I always say entrepreneurship is a lifelong journey of self-discovery. That's right. And I, I have started another company myself, I, you know, within the bio area, and I'm getting another PhD in genetics right now as we start. <laughs> it is very, very, Interesting. And another thing that Gary talked about, the great entrepreneurs were constant learning. Gary was, we used to sit down in Lamar with John Mackey and do philosophical studies. I mean, talks with, uh, with, with uh, the person who was running uh, <coughs> his, his foundation and with, with mm -hmm. John Mackey. And I would go down and sit at the, at the counter with John Mackey and talk about philosophical things. Think about where, where, where everything is going. How many companies are moving to Austin? What, what would it look like? I mean, are we gonna have manufacturing here? 
what does all of that look like? And of course, as you develop that ecosystem, there are so many opportunities for everybody to interact with the larger companies because we know, Gary, that there are two economies. There's the large companies, and then there are the entrepreneurial firms that do most of the work. So I would like to say thanks again for, for joining the IC Square Institute on behalf of the president of the University of Texas at Austin, the director of the IC Square, and my colleagues here at IC Square. Thank you very much for your time and your effort. And we thought we would we would finish with just one more annoying nagging PowerPoint slide just to remind you all um, that we have um, we have um, been talking about lots of ideas for the last business advisory workshop. It would not it will not be a formal time or or place or or a login thing. It's going to be an individualized workshop. Um, so we're thinking about lots of ideas for that, and we'll be sending out um, an email by the end of this week with some information um, for that third business business advisory workshop. A reminder that if you do want your certificate, and we'd love to send you your certificate to complete the form I put in the chat, and I'll send the link out again as a reminder. And the final, um, the final piece is we will be sending out a participant um, survey. We, this being the first time we've run Funnel 2, are very keen to get your honest feedback um, it is one of the one of the requirements by being in the program is to complete the survey. So we will send you multiple reminders to complete it. Um, so please take some time to to walk through that survey that we'll be sending out um, sometime in June um, for for feedback on how to continue to develop these programming. And on that note. I want to hand it back off to anybody else who'd like to say anything. Um, but personally, for me, I have enjoyed every second with all of you as business owners to learn about you and the incredible things that you are doing. So thank you so much. Yes, Osha, you have your, your hand up. Um, uh, hi, first of all, thank you so much, Emily, and the whole entire IC2 team. And this is an amazing program, as I myself have been a U.S. Emerging Leaders Certified Graduate and Goldman Sachs National Cohort Certificate, and I'm currently going through an MSDC, uh, the most intensive program too. So, and I feel this program is completely different, and that it has covered a lot of the areas that hasn't been covered from other courses, especially the sales and to getting us aware how much money we are spending on the sales exhibits, the whole entire cost, those forms filled in is giving us, okay, we spent this much money, now we need to focus on our way. <laughs> that was a very different thing, which I always was struggling on that. And I felt those sheets are so, so important. And then, and then the whole entire percentage on job cost and a lot of things, and especially the session five the pdf which we have the homework to be finished and i felt that's very very intensive and i haven't seen those kind of materials i've done so many courses throughout my life but um those are very very intensive and uh, especially the business advisors one of the courses was amazing and they were trying to help us immediately giving us businesses and very highly qualified business advisors. And I still feel like, how come this course is done so fast? I still need more. <laughs> I was really, really nice. And um, I just wanted to know in case <clears throat> we have any kind of questions and we are trying to scale the business with new models, new strategies and anything, something that we do new, always we have challenges. And is there someone that we can always reach out and take some advice as part of this ICT program? Or do you have any kind of business advisors that's been part of this program that we can reach them out if, they, if we have always in need or kind of, you know, like kind of any help would, would, would appreciate after this program um, is what I would suggest. Yeah, well, let, let me just say this, the Institute is a international networking institute. And from my understanding, the new director would like to take this program nationally. We, we are all over the world from our, from our history. And we have always served and understood the relationship between the university and the growth. What you see in Austin, Texas, all of the creativity was done by our entrepreneurs and the IC Square Institute. 
the MSTC started at IC Square. Moot Corp started at IC Square, which became Texas Venture Labs, which I now run, started at IC Square. And Greg Polk has done, and the rest of the institutes have done so much. So there will always be a place to answer questions and to provide programs as we look to the future of Austin, Texas, as it continues to grow. When I say grow, it, it continues to leapfrog. We will, we will be go down in, in Gary Hoover's uh, town after a while. Because remember, to us, Austin is not just Austin. It is, it is Pflugerville. It is Georgetown. We might go all the way to Columbus. We might go all the way to San Antonio. Picture the Northeast. We might have smart, smart trains between all of the cities in the hill country. So what we like to do, have always done, is to respond to the business needs of the communities as we grow the ecosystem. And I know that it was the IC Square Institute and the George Kosmeski men and women who created the great business atmosphere that we have in Austin, Texas now. From Laura Kilcrease did a great, 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 great job. And to other people who did, Ann Richards was, was, the, was, was the governor. And of course we did the, the governor's fund. I helped do the governor's fund, which was $280 million under, under, under Rick Perry. So we have always really tried to reach out and to make sure that we continue to have these kinds of programs. So the answer is yes. Uh, Jorge would come up with the program and Greg Polk would come up with the program and the new director to make sure that we are always serving uh, the, the community. Yeah, and uh, if, if you send us your, you know, what your issue is and basically outline it and, you know, what you need help with, then that, that's a starting point for us. And uh, yeah, thank you. So the, the one of the topics that said, like when you have a trusted partners, you need to have an NDA and NCA. So um, uh, that was one of the situations I was going through and exactly it just started telling in one of your PowerPoint presentation that it's so important to have the NDA. And it is so important before you start working with your trusted partners. It's so It was like kind of, touching all the important things that I'm going through. And I felt like would have needed a little bit more help on that. Um, so uh, <clears throat> maybe I think I will send an email, hopefully if I need some help on certain and, things. Know, we, have, we have a group called Car the Thompson Group that Carol Thompson put together. That was a glue, another, another entrepreneur that was just important to Dale as far as I'm concerned in getting people to answer those kind of questions. Uh, she did things like NDAs, where, did, where should you put your name tag, what, what program should she go through. It was called uh, the Thompson Group. And she was in Houston. She started in Austin. And we talk all the time. And so maybe we need to start another company like the, the Thompson Group as we continue to go. Tara, do you remember the Thompson, the Thompson Group? <laughs> Carol? No, absolutely. She helped start a lot of programs for women as well. Yeah. Um, first time women entrepreneurs, even women that hadn't quite figured out what they wanted to do could join and then find, you know, yeah. their entrepreneurial passion by looking at problems that they were interested in solving. Exactly right. Yeah, Carol's great. Yeah, Carol is great. Tara, I remember you from somewhere, but I can't put my head around it. I can't, I can't put my head. Were you with the governor's uh, fund? Yeah, I ran that fund. Okay, after uh, the second one that you ran it, right? Yeah, I remember. Yeah. yeah, okay. And who was the Aggie that 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 I put it together with? He wore boots all the time. What was his name? Jonathan Taylor. No, it wasn't Jonathan. He was a real Aggie. You could tell he was Aggie when you looked at it. <laughs> oh, Ellison. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mark Ellison. Mark Ellison, right. my main man. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the guy, yeah. We put it together right there at the Institute. Okay, 